So our first session is on healthcare, um, as we call it, rewriting life. From genomics to targeted therapeutic interventions for disease management, uh, the advances in healthcare are increasingly dependent on getting and analyzing large amounts of patient data. Um, these developments offer up a future of man tailor-made treatment, early detection, disease prevention, and more, and they obviously also raise questions of data privacy, data management, and equity in healthcare, e uh, equity or the lack of equity, lack of equal access to healthcare. So we're going to have three speakers this morning, each of whom is going to be discussing these issues from a different perspective, and then, then we'll have a panel. The first speaker is Emmanuel Fombu, who's the author of the book, The Future of Healthcare, and he'll be talking about the role of AI in analyzing these growing oceans of patient data. Emmanuel, please come on up. So good morning, everyone, and um, thanks for waking up very early today to uh, join us for this uh, beautiful discussion on the future of healthcare. So today, I'll be talking about this concept of uh, predictive medicine. So background-wise, um, I'm a cardiologist uh, by training, and um, I'm also a clinical researcher, um, and I've spent time doing a lot of research using technologies in healthcare. So today, um, I will show you some of the things that um, are in stock for us. So here in this picture, that's my grandmother, right? Uh, my grandmother, uh, or my family, is from a, a country in Central Africa known as Cameroon, if, if anyone knows where Cameroon is, <laughs> right? And if you know um, anything about Cameroon, uh, we are famous for having a sort of soccer. We are great in soccer. The second piece of this is we make good cigar wrappers. <laughs> it's a good thing about cigar. So my grandmother enjoyed those cigars in Cameroon. Um, I remember being a kid um, and watching out for my grandmother while she would smoke behind the house. If my mom was coming, then I would tell her to throw away the cigarette, <laughs> like to hide the cigar. Um, fast forward, uh, my grandmother grew up at a time when women were not educated um, in Cameroon. She had a daughter who was my mother. And my grandmother sold tomatoes on the side of the road in Cameroon. If I look at the African lady selling tomatoes, that's my grandmother. But she put my mom to school. Uh, my mom went to school in Europe, and uh, she became um, a doctor. And she lived to move to the United States. Um, I have two younger siblings, and we're all doctors, by a random chance in my family. Uh, but that's my grandmother. My grandmother had diabetes, um, hypertension, and she died from heart failure about 10 years ago. Right, so that's my grandmother. And what happens is, if you go to a doctor's office today, the doctors always ask this question, right? Do you have a family history of a disease? Right? They always ask you that. If you tell someone, I have cancer, or you had family history. If you, if you say, I had diabetes, do you have family history? This question comes up all the time. So that's my grandmother's story. That's my mother. So my grandmother, that's in Cameron, by the way. She retired about uh, three years ago, and she lives between um, the US and Cameron. So this is in Cameron. My, my mom is uh, in her late 60s, and she gets up every morning, and she goes jogging, and she exercises, more than I do, <laughs> right? So at her age, she has no diabetes, and she has no hypertension, and she has no heart failure. So if she goes to the doctor, and they ask her, do you have a family history of disease? Is that relevant to her, right? Is my was my grandmother's diabetes or hypertension because of genetics or environmental factors? She does a challenge that comes in. If I go into a doctor and they ask me if I have a family history of disease, of hypertension or diabetes, what does that really mean <laughs> to me, right? Uh, so with that being said, the idea is there's more to health than genetics. So if you look at here, th this graph here shows you what happened in China. So this is uh, in 1980, the number of people or the rate of diabetes in China was 0.67% uh, in 1980. Look at that to 2011, where the rates went up to 9.7%. So the question becomes, did the genes in the people in China change over time? The genes did not change, right? What happened between 1980 and 2011? People got wealthier in China, right? They have access to different kinds of food. So you understand it's, act, it's eating beautiful junk food that increased diabetes rates. So it's a more environmental factors as opposed to just genetics. Genetics do play a role, but it's not the only thing, 
right? The, 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 the factors in this. And so, has anyone here ever been to uh, St. Louis, Missouri? Wow. Four people, that's great. Plus me, five. <laughs> Beautiful St. Louis, Missouri. So if you go to St. Louis, Missouri, there's a street in St. Louis called Delma Boulevard, right? That splits that city into a northern part and a southern part. The northern part, is, as, as you could tell, it's uh, the poorer side of the city, right? So lower income values, uh, people make less money. It's uh, poorer, less educated people in the northern part than the southern part. Southern part is much wealthier. Same city. The rates of diabetes and cancer are seven times higher in the northern part of that same city than the southern part of the city. In the exact same city. So what does this tell you? You can look at St. Louis as one example, but this, hap this applies globally, right? You can look at it from a country level, a city level, um, a national level, a global level. You see this as, as an exact replication of what happens. This tells you that there are also things called socioeconomic determinants of health, right, that affect health. How much money you have also affects your health. So this is a great example of this. And even twins, identical twins born together, hopefully, right, end up looking different based on diff different things, different environmental factors and other things that happen. So these are things that we know. But yet, when we design clinical research, or we, de we design trials, I know we talked about trials earlier, <laughs> right? Um, when we do trials, we create this perfect world, right? That's what happens. We say, let's say we're doing a diabetes trial. We want people between the ages of 18 and 45 that have a certain weight that look perfect. That's what we do. And then what happens is, once the drug gets approved, we take a drug to the market, we expect it to give it to everyone, <laughs> right? We test it in a few people and then give it to everyone. Um, that's, that's one angle. In most clinical trials today, very few women are represented in clinical trials, right? Most people in clinical trials are white men. But then you do the trials and then you say, hey, this drug works, and then guess what? Everyone takes it, <laughs> right? It works for everyone, which is not real. Because the real world doesn't look like the perfect world, right? <laughs> that's what the real world looks like. So there are many variables in the real world. And so what is happening today in today's market is insurance companies or payers are getting smarter and they are saying, if you do a trial in this perfect world, I'm only paying for the drug in this perfect world. I'm not paying for people that don't fit in that perfect world. So because of that, there's a new emergence of a thing called real world evidence, right? Where people are saying, show me that your product works in the real world. And how does it have work in the real world? To do that, we have to look at each person as an individual, right? Two people with diabetes, are not exact same people with diabetes, right? If we both had bananas this morning for breakfast, my blood sugar levels could be different from your blood sugar levels having the exact same banana because we're individuals. And so what technology does today is personalize that experience. And the same thing is happening everywhere, right? If you have Netflix or you watch Netflix, your movie choices are, are, are targeted to you. If you're on Google and you have your ads, your ads are targeted to you, right? It's a personalized way of looking at things. And that's what technology makes possible. This guy clearly is not from Dubai. Anybody know what this guy is? <laughs> so, all right. So his name is Raffray. He's uh, Jean-André Raffray. He's a French guy. He was a lawyer. And in, 19, uh, in 1956, this guy um, was 46. And at that time, in the south of France, in the Provence, southern part of France, there was a new law. It was a con contingency law. And the plan was, if you had an elderly person in the apartment and you paid your rent for them, when they die, you get to own your apartment, okay? At that time, like I said, he was 46. The average age for women at the time, life expectancy was about 75 years old. And he saw this lady, and the lady was this lady. So this lady was 90 years old, okay? It makes a good business deal, right? She's 90, she's way past her life expectancy. He's 46, so he said, hey, I'll pay 2,500 francs for her apartment, and when she dies, I own the place. Fast forward, 32 years later, <laughs> by the way, she was 90, right? 32 years later, he was dead, and he, she was still alive. <laughs> so her name is Marie Carmont. She's the longest living human ever that ever lived. And guess what, she smoked her whole life. Right? What is the point of this story? The point of the story is you cannot take data on the overall population and try to make it to the individual, right? Because each person is completely different. And by the time that he died, he had paid twice the value of that apartment, and he never lived there. 
<laughs> right? So that's a great example of this. So we are, we are unique individuals, and so we have different diet plans, right? People tell you, hey, you should be vegan, or you should be this. At the end, you are the individual, right? So you have to personalize that experience to you, than looking at things in general. And what is more depressing in healthcare today is this concept of medicine where, we, where we're more reactive. So today, if you are sick, you go to your doctor, uh, the doctor doesn't really know what's happening, they say, go home and come back if, if it gets worse. Let's see what happens, right? So you literally wait <laughs> till you get sicker and sicker and sicker when it's really bad, then they give you medicine, right? Or you show up and it says, well, we don't know if it's cancer, the tumor is this big. Let's see what happens, right? You go home and you wait. Come back six months later. Or now it's really big. Oops, cancer, let's take it out. That, that's a mindset <laughs> today, right? Um, or you spend 12 years in medical school, um, study medicine, and then when you become finished, good, you're a doctor, they take you to the hospital and put you in there to wait for sick people. It's a different way of thinking, <laughs> right? So what I'm proposing is this new idea of predictive medicine, where we are more engaged with our healthcare from a day-to-day -day basis, right? Why wait to get sick before you intervene? Why not understand the risk of disease going forward, and then you could do, you could modify your lifestyle and they understand what exactly is the best preference for you, right? So you can have the best outcome. That's where healthcare is going. And I'll give some examples earlier so you could see exactly um, how we are leveraging technology to actually make this possible, right? And this idea of predictive medicine and preventive uh, medicine. So this is a study um, that we designed um, a couple of years ago. And this, this study was based on the idea of how do you understand quality of life improvement in patients, right? So, if you have, uh, if you, we'll go, no one goes to the hospital because they got bored at home one day and they say, hey, let me go hang out at the hospital. That's not how it works, right? You don't feel well, so you, went to the, you go to the hospital. But how do we look at quality of life? Today in clinical research, we give patients something called PROs, so patient reported outcomes, right? So you have a stack of paper that they ask you to say, how did you feel two weeks ago or a week ago? I can't even tell you how I felt three days ago or yesterday, right? But you expect people to recall from two weeks ago. And so at the time, I was thinking, we have all these watches today, like Fitbit, Apple Watch, and all this to track activity. Why, can, wh why do I have to ask you? Why can't I just track your activity and see if you're active or not? That was a constant behind this. So we designed this study. This was the very first study ever done in the heart failure patient population. And so we tracked these patients over time, right? So everyone had to watch on. We look at your activity. The blue uh, light you see, the sensor there, it looks at light exposure. So if you have the watch on, we could tell if the lights were on, if you were sleeping, if you are moving, just activity. And from this study, we realized that we could predict the risk of uh, someone having a stroke or atrial fibrillation, right? Atrial fibrillation, irregular heartbeat that causes a clot, then you get a stroke or, or something, right? So just from this basic study, we realized that we could do this. We had 140 patients in this study over a six month period that we followed them. We ended up with 41 years of longitudinal data. These are massive data sets just in 140 people. Compare this to a typical trial where you have like 8,000 people you're doing trials in, follow them for like years and years and years. We did a study in less than a year with 140 people, but more data sets. And we were able to predict this, um, this, this kind of things. And so that same kind of concept is what led to the Apple Watch today. Right, so if you see the Apple Watch today is able to predict atrial fibrillation. You heard about it, it just means that if you have a regular heartbeat, the Apple Watch can tell you or could alert you ahead of time. So the study that we did, that's a background uh, piece of this. So you see a lot of this uh, being more common or more commonly done. And the same thing is not only for um, the watch. Another market that we've used also is like voice, right? There are companies today that could use voice to predict Alzheimer's from voice. You could use voice for dementia. You could use voice for depression and suicide prevention just from voice. So voice is becoming a new biomarker with the same concept, right? You have a baseline collection of data and you could look at change from baseline. Right, you could tell about disease progression over time, and you could intervene ahead of time. So that's one side of it. My next favorite place in the world, next to Dubai, uh, anyone been to Cleveland, Ohio? Oh wow, look, more people. <laughs> so good. So I was in Cleveland, go to the Cleveland Clinic, and I took an Uber from the airport. And this driver, um, that was my driver, she was in her late 60s as well, this lady. And while we're driving, she had no idea what I was in town for, so she pulled up this app on her, on her phone. And I said, what is that? Her grandson was in college and he had diabetes. You notice she could track his blood sugar levels in real time, right? You have most devices today have sensors in people, right? She's tracking the blood sugar levels. So he got up in the morning, so if, if he had no juice or he didn't take his drugs, she could see in real time and she could intervene ahead of time, right? To say, hey, take your drugs or take something. So these are things that are happening today. So it's not like a fictional thing. 
This happens today in the real world setting, right? So, but this is in a disease state. Can we do this in a preventive mood, right? And, and, and do this, but this is happening. These are things that you, you, you see a lot more um, happen recently. Please don't mind the food on the table back there. So this is um, a company called Butterfly Network out of Connecticut. Um, and has, has anyone ever seen an ultrasound device, like the big bulky ultrasound machines? Those cost about over $100,000, right, to get them done. This device is the exact same as an ultrasound, but it goes on an iPhone. But the best part of this is you don't need to be an expert to actually use it. So that device takes about thousands of pictures per second, goes to the cloud, and they have algorithms that could actually read the images in real time. So if, for example, I mean, I'm, if, let's say I'm a lay person, and I say, hey, can you do a cardiac echo at home, right? It's a very sophisticated procedure. And if I, if I have no idea where my heart is, and I take the device and I put it on my head, it's going to tell me exactly where to go. So it, it, you give, on the screen, it tells you to go down and exactly where you need to go, and you can actually capture and do a full cardiac echo in real time. And this device, guess how much it is? $2,000 for the same device. Um, the algorithms behind this and the data sets behind this were trained on patients from Uganda, <laughs> right? Because if you don't know, the hearts in Uganda are just like the same as the hearts in Connecticut. <laughs> Same kind of concept, right? And you have less regulation in, in, in places. That's why, to me personally, when, when I come down to, uh, like, you know, to Dubai, this is like my, my third trip in Dubai in the last six months, I've, I've been pushing for the whole idea of you have a perfect market where you have a great system in place where you could actually test technologies here they could use to help people in the Middle East, that you could have people globally as well, right? So it's having the right envir environment and right support from the right government, you could do these things on scale, regardless of where we are. So that's, that's, my, that's why I keep coming up here, and I hope I come back again, um, <laughs> repeatedly. And, and um, I'm almost done here. But this lady here, uh, her name is Susan Potter. So Susan Potter uh, donated her body to science, so before she died, she actually got her whole entire body scanned, and when she died, she was cut up in little pieces, and they created the first virtual cadaver. That's medical students around the globe could actually look at a body and study it, right? The concept of organ donation is not a very strange concept, right? We do organ donations. Some people donate livers, kidneys, those things happen. But in the future, where we're going is we not only donate data, like body organs, but we donate what? Data, the gift of data. That's why I decided to do this. So I realized that I kept talking about this, but I never actually did it myself. So two months ago, I decided to get my whole genome sequenced. And I wanted to find out what disease I was at risk of having. Like, because the question I started off with, right? Do I, am I at risk of having hypertension or diabetes? So I got my genes done. And I picked this particular company, Nebula. I don't get paid by them, but uh, I got paid by Nebula. Why? Because their data is locked on a blockchain and there's privacy around it compared to 23andMe, it's a completely different kind of model, right? So you look at, this is a great example of how you could use privacy as a business model. So I picked Nebula, I got my gene sequenced, and what did I find out? That I have a gene that puts me at risk for hypertension, right? I have that, I don't have, I don't, I don't have hypertension today, but I have that gene that puts me at risk, that's one. The second thing I found out is I have a special gene that makes me able to smell asparagus in urine. Very useful gene, <laughs> right? So things I found about myself. So what does that do for me now? So now, now that I know that, what do I do? So now I realize that what happens if I eat less meat, right? What happens if I exercise twice a week? What happens if I don't sleep for a couple of nights or uh, climb Kilimanjaro or don't drink wine or beer, whatever the case is, right? What if, what if I change those things in my life? Which is the question we get to answer today. What if I do that? Because you realize that life, right, the gene is just the beginning of life, right? So life, life is a story, and your genes are just the beginning. So just because you know you have a risk for a particular disease does not mean you are doomed to have a disease, right? Because my decisions matter. If I know I, I'm going to have hypertension down the road, what do I do today? So then I want to exercise more, right? I want to maybe eat less meat. I want to eat more, maybe more veggies sometimes. I want to go jogging. Those things influence life. And decisions that I make puts me at risk up and down that curve, right? Across that journey. And it's a personalized journey um, that, that we need to have. So with this being said, I think uh, that's the value of what technology does. And if we do this and we follow this path and realize that life is a full journey and we have a role to play around that, that I think we'll live um, longer and healthier lives. So thank you. I'm available for questions after.